Okay. Great. Uh, all right. To introduce our next speaker, Patrick Esser is a principal research scientist at Runway, focused on machine learning for creative applications. So he was also a developer of Stable Diffusion and VQGAN, um, part of that same conference group at University of Heidelberg. Uh, so Patrick, so great to have you here, and I'm really looking forward to seeing some of the applications that you're working on, and also yeah, just all your other thoughts on uh, what you've been what you've been doing with these incredible models. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, can everybody hear me? Yep, it's perfect. Perfect. And I think I can go through the slides in here, right? Yep, nice. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. Really glad to be here. Um, my talk is called Food for Diffusion. Um, basically, I just want to talk well, I guess like the, the one point is uh, to talk a bit, to give a bit of food for thought also what one can, can work with uh, on the fusion models. Um, but the other part of the title is basically that I will talk a bit about the inputs to, to the model and how that affects uh, the output. So essentially, what I want to start with is that composition is something that matters a lot for aesthetics. Um, so here, this is a nice example, I guess, from um, Moonrise Kingdom by, um, yeah, which which always has like really nice compositions. And this is in a way where it really becomes kind of clear that there is something going on, something specific about the composition of the frames. Um, while still being beautiful. So I think this will be generally a, quite a hard goal to reach that kind of uh, quality in, in the aesthetics, how, how scenes are composited. But um, yeah, I think we are, it's definitely something we should strive for. And while those are uh, not generated, they've been made by a human master, um, at least like, yeah, something like the first slide um, that is generated. Yeah, so basically for composition, I guess um, I'm not really an expert in the topic, but I guess like you could on a high level say that the relative position of different objects in a scene that make up the, the image, um, it matters, right? So on a very, very basic level, you have to think about like, um, positions in images. Mm. Yeah, I think one should also say like, even though even though we train on huge databases like Lion, um, which come from everywhere and contain all kinds of different content, um, it should, one should still uh, realize that it's like, we don't take even those pictures are not random, right? Like um, even people like me who are not aware of uh, good compositions or anything, even if I take a picture, I usually take a picture of some object. So what we can generally expect is that um, images will be object centric, for example, it already puts like a weak bias into the data set. And the question is then really kind of like, okay, how can the model actually um, figure out where to put objects, be that for matching the object-centric prior or be that for um, coming up with good compositions. So kind of like as a little thought experiment, if you want, um, is the idea like imagine you're a convolution, like usually or for example, uh, for for image diffusion models, we the backbone of the diffusion model is often a unit, which mainly consists of um, convolutions. Not completely true. There's also we also use attention most of the time. Um, nevertheless, um, yeah, if you if you look at the basic operation of a convolution, it's like you use a fixed set of weights and slide that over the window, right? So you apply the same um function so to say 
uh, to every point in the image, you slide it across. So now with the diffusion model, if you sample, eventually like your first step will start from a pure noise image as shown on the top right here, right? So if, if you're a convolution kind of, and you get your input, which really consists only of noise, and you see two different noise patterns, it's basically impossible for you to tell where you are in the image, like two patches in here, they just look absolutely the same. Um, so basic question is actually like how, well, we know that it works, right? Like we do get object centric samples out of the model. So um, the question is actually like, where does that come from? And there's really nice work about this by Islam et al. Uh, on, in, in a bit of a con different context, not for generative models, but for discriminative models, um, which analyzes, first of all, like how much position information um, convolutional networks encode, and also analyze the, the mechanisms of, uh, of how that works. And yeah, I guess like one of the, on a high level, the, the high level finding or one of the conclusions is that um, one way that CNNs do get positional or do encode positional information is through a combination of having a large receptive field and the fact that we often use zero padding for in combination with those uh, for convolutions, right? So here's a visualization of, of that principle, basically. Um, so if compared to the, to the previous slide, we now have a model that has a um, larger receptive field. And then if you are at some point in your, in your image, you want to apply your convolutional kernel there, but the problem becomes like you will, it will, it might be bigger than the image, right? And so the simplest solution is to just add zeros in that position. And so if you do that, as visualized here with the, um, the black borders, basically, you see that now those two, like what a, what a convolution sees in those two different locations actually does differ, differ. Like now it sees, oh, on the left, there's a black border. So I'm probably somewhere on the left side of the image. And similarly, for the right patch, you, you can see that there is a black bar on the bottom. So I know I'm somewhere close to the uh, bottom. And of course, like since all of this is um, learned, um, it, might, it might come up with very sophisticated ways how that encodes the position. Um, yeah, so. With this kind of like uh, idea of how how actually like a, a CNN and thereby also probably a diffusion model actually orients itself or like things about uh, compositions in uh, samples and images, uh, I want to digress a little bit uh, and go towards textures, right? So textures, I would say, are a bit different from or typical images in the sense that here it's, you wouldn't say it, there's no like real object prior in the, uh, in the images. In fact, I think one of the things that um, is like a helpful description is kind of like that they look pretty much the same everywhere, right? Like you can look at any patch and they kind of look uh, very similar, at least like often in a statistical sense. And yeah, so in that case, it might actually like clash a bit with, uh, with the idea of having um, position encoded because you want to look at the same. And also, yeah, one, one also makes use of that uh, idea that textures kind of look the same everywhere if you want to generate large textures, right? Often this will be like a, a large area that you want to paint, be that in a 3D um, asset or whatever, you, you need to create like potentially arbitrarily large textures. So 
there are a lot of words on or like the most basic idea is that since it looks everywhere the same you can just take like a small patch and then you just tile it arrange it next to each other to get um a larger texture and so one could try to do that essentially with um with samples like a nice thing that, that does work very well with like um text to diffusion models you might say like uh, uh as a prompt you just ask for a texture patch of the word right here shown on the right is the the result that you get out and it kind of makes sense it might make for a nice uh nice texture if you can increase the increase the size but if you do that now you just tile it as shown on the left side you can clearly see that they are like yeah you can clearly see that it is tiled right so that's not very desirable it doesn't really look good there is still basically um yeah there are, i would say there are two issues one is um that like the spatially it's not homogeneous enough so there is still quite a bit of structure uh in the image which might come from something like a uh, zero padding general model knows and the other one is the blending around the around the edges right and yeah like i said this has been i mean it's has been extensively analyzed and there are many algorithms for that um for doing proper texture tiling and one approach is uh um was described in his work by heights uh on high performance by example noise using a histogram preserving blending operator which i think is really popular for texture tiling and it performs often very well um i think it's just that it makes like again very rather strong assumptions that what you that the image actually can be described well by its uh, statistic and yeah if you so if we apply something like this now shown on the left um the result is definitely improved it looks uh, much much more natural the, the boundaries but generally speaking one can still see like this structure of a two by three grid right just because there's so much um this little structure left so yeah if one takes a look at this like padding behavior um and if one thinks about that, this might be one of the core things how the model thinks about position. And we want to get a more homogeneous um, texture out of it. A uh, very simple idea is to just replace, you have an existing model, um, and you just replace the padding mechanism in all of your convolutional layers to do like a circular padding. And what you get out of that is then basically your sample becomes something like here shown on the bottom right and without any post-processing uh, so the image on the left doesn't use any blending um, you just tile them together and you see that they actually fit which is yeah which is a really nice property because now you can directly generate those um, textures and have them directly tileable right without any post-processing and also without any any real changes to the model. Mm. Yeah, so I think I really like this example because it's I would say rather simple, like both in terms of you you can take an existing model and just uh, apply the change, and all of a sudden you get. Um, you get samples with uh, completely different properties just by thinking a bit about how the model internally works. And yeah, maybe the other thing that really surprised me for this example is that that it actually works, right? Like often I would say you have some intuition about how the model works regarding like the padding. Um, but now in this example here, yeah, we go in and directly manipulate the way how that is handled, right? And that changes like everything internally, all the internal representations of the model. Um, and just the fact that um, that this still works is quite surprising because I think you can, there are so many examples where you can um, really mess up the uh, model performance really quickly just by 
um, by changing slight details. Like I, I had issues where like I would train a model with a very specific um, um, resampling algorithms for resizing training examples. And at test time, if you would use any other, it would like completely fail. So very often there is this fact that uh, models can can overfit to specifics uh, very strongly, but in this case, it uh, it really performs nicely and produces the desired result. Okay, um, that yeah, the training data kind of brings me to my second point that I wanted to talk about, um, which now goes again back to what we started with, and uh, which is kind of the opposite of textures, um, that usually there is compositional structure in images. So what we see here is basically the first page that you find if you go to the um, website of the Lion aesthetics data set for a relatively high aesthetics threshold. Um, and you see it in their, in their original form, right? Like all the images have different aspect ratios. They also have different resolutions. They're just resized for visualization. But I guess the, the important thing is like, um, yeah, they usually have very different aspect ratios. And the other thing to note is that actually more often than not, they are not square, right? Um, I guess like the two most popular formats are basically like either like a, um, landscape format, something like this, which is like a white screen aspect ratio, or also like a portrait mode, which yeah is especially popular for portraits, right? But also for other images. And I mean, I would say um, that a lot of those images come from artists who actually created them. And um, I mean, they usually put thought into like how they arrange objects in, a, in an image, right? That That is part of what the image uh, should express. So I think that's actually quite important data. But if you then look at what we actually do quite often when we when we train those models, it's like, I would say, basically a simple technical artifact that we want to stack all our training examples into a single tensor to have a good memory layout that we can um, feed it through the network fast, right? We want to uh, already takes long enough, so you have to um, make sure the performance is good. So to, to make that possible, this stacking of images, what we usually do, we just extract square images, resize them to a common size, and we get a batch that for this example basically then looks like that. Um, I mean, the images still look good from a first perspective, but um, yeah, like I said, I, I think like in this example, it's not even that bad, like, but we can often see like here already indicated that heads get a bit, little bit cut off here and uh, there are no more hands visible. And yeah, here the composition completely changes where we, where we did see something of the background behind the um, bars here. So yeah, I think it really changes the, the, the whole um, meaning or definitely destroys the composition of the of the intended original image, right? And okay, as a consequence of what happens if we do that, right? Um, so we do this fixed size training and then what we see like as a first first observation just um, regarding the, the generalization is that, okay, so we train on typically here, this, this model is also trained on 512 by 512. Uh, at this resolution, um, we get reasonably good images. Like I did not excessively cherry pick those here. This one's definitely not perfect, but you can see like it overall gets the gist. And if you produce like a, quite a few more samples, uh, you usually find pretty good, good ones as well. But then you um, try to do something else, right, during sampling time. It's in general, that's one of the nice things of a 
convolutional model that you can just like um, change the change the shape during during inference and produce samples at different resolutions. Um, yeah, and I think this is relatively interesting what happens here. Um, you can see often if you go to like higher resolutions, um, you very often see this repeated objects floating around somewhere in the image. And once again, I think like if you yeah, if you think back to the fact that the model usually does encode the boundary it was trained on, like it knows like there is a 512 by 512 is what I'm training at. And most of the time I do expect an object like a person or something in the middle of that image, right? And that's basically what it's doing here, right? Like this is double the size. So I guess like the, the most extreme case would be like if you see like kind of four um, four reasonable images, um, even though their composition doesn't make sense, right? Like their relationship is just floating around because um, yeah, uh, 1024 by 1024 image is not a random combination of four 512 by 512 images. So there we, um, yeah, we really quickly run into trouble in higher resolutions. And something else that we, um, which is maybe even, even a bit more surprising I find is um, that the same happens if we go to lower resolutions. Like if we sample this model at 256 by 256 here in the top left, then it actually really um, doesn't make any sense anymore. So um, the one's also interesting, like hard to tell what exactly happens. It's like all of a sudden now borders are overlapping, which the model never saw. So yeah, I think that's that's one of the points where I mean like, um, yeah, don't, don't expect to get magical generalization to all the cases, right? Uh, we see it doesn't. Um, yeah, and then, yeah, one thing we, we explored quite a bit now is basically that we train on dynamic sizes. So that means both that we take, um, we keep the original aspect ratios, which is more about preserving the composition of the scenes, but we also keep the, all the original resolutions up to a threshold. So we train somewhere between um, 256 and 2048. Um, and yeah, what we see is definitely that things improve quite a bit. So for 512 by 512, we still get um, nice results. In this case also maybe an interesting composition might be related to the, to the different aspect ratios as well. Um, for trend 24 by trend 24, it also produces good results. Um, for 256 by 256, I guess you can see that it's like a bit more, well, I mean, it is a lower resolution image. Um, also all looks a bit more washy, but that is also um, actually like a yeah fact of that this is also like a two stage model and uh, the first stage also. Um, introduces reconstruction errors at, at lower resolutions. Um, yeah, generally speaking, I don't think you want to go like to something like 256 by 256, but uh, it is actually important that you can at least do like one size uh, smaller in case you want to do pretty extreme aspect ratios, right? You want to have, might have like a very long side combined with a very small side. Um, yeah, and that brings me also to the, to the other point, which I think is maybe even more interesting, is like this um, this fact about, yeah, composing images at different aspect ratios. Here uh, is an example batch for, um, yeah, landscape um, mode uh, on the top. This is the one that was trained uh, on dynamic sizes and dynamic aspect ratios. You can see that it um, produces uh, quite nice results often. And it also seems to have some, I mean, I don't want to judge that. I'm not, a, like I said, not an expert, but I think it's, uh, uh, can also be used to, to explore nice compositions of, uh, like often, like most of the time you're interested in probably something like widescreen or different formats. And I think that with something like this, you can 
it provides a much better tool to not only explore like the specific content um, that you want to put somewhere, but also the the composition, right? You can you can get inspired by that as well. Um, yeah, whereas the, the the same model basically with the, the static size training at five point twelve by five point twelve, again we already saw that um, doesn't make much uh, sense in this case. We again see all those repetitions of um, objects in the center. Yeah, that one's just uh, basically just the same example, but for portrait mode. Um, I think that's something that also that that I hear a lot. Um, people are also a bit annoyed with um, that often if you if you do a portrait mode and you're interested in in sampling like a, a full body person, um, all kinds of things, uh, funny things happen. Like this one is very common that you that it just cuts off the head, right? Which is related to what I was talking about in the in the training batch example. They're just often cut off and we don't see it. So kind of not too useful anymore. And the other one is this duplication of bodies, which sometimes really provide funny looking outputs, but uh, in general, it's also not, not really what you want, right? Whereas we can see again, I think, especially for this for this port remote uh, with characters, since we train on their original size, I think there are quite a few of those in the training data set. Um, we get much more coherent um, generations of characters. Yes. Um, let's see about the time. Okay. I think I'm, um, yeah, maybe I will stop here and take questions if there are any. Awesome. Thank you so much, Patrick. That was a really you know, deep dive into, you know, sort of ways to make uh, diffusion models work, um, which is, is pretty nice to see because you know, a lot of the time you just see the output, right? Like, oh, check out my fancy image on Twitter. And um, <laughs> it, it's actually kind of revealing to see that there's a, there's a fair amount of like careful, um, you know, intuition and engineering that's needed um, to get this out. Um, we have a few questions from the audience. So one of the ones here um, from Evan Jones is, uh, based on the way convolutions learn to orient themselves in the image, do you suspect composition is better at the edges, but weaker towards the center where the guideposts are fewer? Yeah, that's a really good question, actually. Um, I think there are two things that one has to differentiate with the composition. One is really this fact that because you crop, you never see the original composition, right? So it's, in that case, if you do the center cropping, it's much, much less common that you actually see like a, in a widescreen image, there would be a widescreen image that you see like a long stretch of nothing. And then maybe at like one third or something of the, of the scene, you have like a portrait, which mm -hmm. like, might be like a common composition. So since you never see that, I, I think like that is one problem why the model would never really, if you ask for a portrait, why it would never really make a long stretch of, of nothing before it puts a person. Um, yeah, so from that, I don't think the convolutions are too much involved, uh, but definitely from the from the perspective of, yeah, orienting itself, um, I think actually that's, one can go quite a bit deeper into that question and really ask the question like, why are we actually not providing it a better way of orienting itself, right? Mm -hmm. um, there, are, there is the idea of concatenating coordinates or uh, some, some representations of the coordinates um, to the, to the data input. And that can often, like depending on the task, I think it can really improve results. Um, one reason why often, why it is not done by default, I think, it's because you again even you you lose generalization to other resolutions even more right because yeah. now the model really starts to use the the precise spacing between points the the resolution that you train at and if you change that then during during sampling time it's like really confused so i think that's why you often don't do it but i think with if we go to dynamic science training um this will be very interesting to explore to see 
because then, yeah, if the model sees all the different resolution grids and different sizes, then we might get the generalization nevertheless. Thanks. Yeah, I, I, it feels a little bit to me like um, in the space of diffusion models, we're kind of trying to rediscover what are like the techniques from computer vision that we've used for decades. And now what are the equivalent ones, right? Like, you know, we have all these hacks for data augmentation, which work really well. And I think it's pretty much too soon, right, to know exactly, you know, how you do this in the diffusion uh, process. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think that's super interesting topics. And also on a very high level, I think that's, uh, I'm, I'm always excited about working with a new technology while reading maybe some um, older paper and trying to see how those ideas match or can help each other. I think that's super fruitful. Maybe we can take one uh, tongue in cheek question. Uh, so, you know, maybe this question of dynamic training, resizing and stuff, you know, will this uh, fix hands? And may maybe a question like part of that for me has always been like, why, what is it about, you know, stable diffusion that gives you these like, you know, nightmarish like interlocking hands? What's the intuition there? Like, what is it about hands that are like such a difficult thing to do? I mean, I used to be a painter and I used to struggle with like, you know, feet and hands, I hated them. So my own images were always like, you know, hands hidden, but like, is it the same for diffusion models? Yeah, um, I mean, <laughs> uh, actually I think we, we already made a bit of, a, uh, of progress there because I mean, it used to be that, that it was really freaky looking at uh, faces that were generated. Often they still are, <laughs> but uh, but uh, but we're getting pretty good at them. Um, I mean, yeah. Also, there I think we we also talk a lot about that. We definitely think it's there's this human part where it seems that we're really overly sensitive to human anatomy, so <laughs> we just notice that so much more than anything else. Um, but then, yeah, I think. At least what we saw also a lot when we, I mean, we trained a lot of this, um, these first stages, right, which try to compress images uh, to, to a smaller representation and then reconstruct it from there. And I would actually say that that already there, we very often observe that, like that faces look very strange and uh, especially hands. And I really think it is also related to the, to the size of those features. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, it works better if you if you ask it for a full frontal or close up portrait, right? Sure. Because there's like essentially, if you look at it relatively, there are now more codes that that work to represent the face than if you have like a, a face that's very far away. It becomes much smaller, and maybe there's like only a high level. If you look at the receptive field of that code, it might be only a single representation. So. So yep. there's more, you have to compress it more and that's where you lose information and things get worse. Um, so I think that's a big part. And the hands are definitely more, even more difficult due to their size, right? But we'll get there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think already in Stable Diffusion 2, you can see great improvements. So yeah. this is uh, it's pretty exciting. Um, but, you know, the, the great mystery of hands will be solved. <laughs> yeah. The biggest problem of our times. <laughs> You know, some people are, you know, doing protein modeling and, you know, <laughs> climate change and we're worried about hands. <laughs> yeah, hands consist of protein, so. <laughs> so, yeah, um, with that, uh, I'd like to thank you again, Patrick, for joining us. It's uh, been a real pleasure. And, um, yeah, we'll, we'll see you at the next event or you know, yeah. around. It was really nice to be here. Bye.